I'm Dr. Todd Huffman. I'm a physics fellow here at Lady Margaret Hall. And uh, I was given the task of introducing our uh, distinguished speaker. And, and I was looking very forward to this until I discovered that, in fact, um, <clears throat> in fact, just recently, that, that this is not the Canada seminar, um, <laughs> which is actually next week. And this is very unfortunate because I had, I had everything planned out as to you know, the great Canadian invention of the internet and uh, our speakers from MIT, which is another well-known Canadian institution. Um, but, but now I can't do that. So I think I'll just have to introduce our speaker in a, in a more normal way. Uh, Dr. Uh, David Clark, in the mid-70s, was one of the original inventors of the internet. Uh, so I'm very pleased that we have him here to speak for, with it, for us. From 1981 to 1989, he was a chief protocol architect of the internet. And he is a senior research scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Uh, he also received his PhD there. Um, he has been a chairman for approximately eight years of the Computer Science and Techno Te Telecommunications Board of uh, U.S. National Academies. And he is here uh, to tell us about why the Internet is the way it is and why it will be very different in 10 years. So uh, he, this is a presentation that is given both by Lady Margaret Hall the Oxford Internet Institute, and the eHorizon Institute. And I think we should uh, welcome Dr. Clark to tell us about the future of the Internet. Thank you very much. Right. I'm actually over here as part of a workshop that was held at the Oxford Internet Institute, which was a multidisciplinary workshop trying to look at the future of the Internet. And I'm a technologist who has come to tell you that the technologists are not in charge. We figured that out about 10 years ago. It was very painful. The title of this talk really should be Why the Internet is the Way It Is, which I will explain in five minutes because it's ridiculously simple, why it will be different in 10 years, and then the third part should be and how we have to think very differently to make it so. And what I actually want to talk about is that third part, which is how you have to think differently. But if I'd said all that in the title, it would have been as long as the abstract. So I pruned it down to this very long title as it is. So, 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 don't do that to me. Ahem. Now we go back, we go back, right. It just had to wake up. Uh, so I have been working on the internet since about 1975. In 1975, there were 12 of us, and nobody was watching it. We could do anything we wanted. And I like to remind people, I mean, for most people, I'm sorry, the speed with which the internet has entered the culture is fascinating, and to me, a little astonishing. Uh, I think it really came to people's attention sometime around the mid-'90s, but that's only 10 years ago. And the idea that it was designed 30 years ago even either seems like a very long time ago or just yesterday, depending on how you think about it. The thing I like to remind people is that at the time the original design was put together, we had no idea if the basic idea would work. Somebody once likened the Internet. We, th we thought that the, the mascot of the Internet should be the bumblebee because, as you know, theoretically it can't fly, but it does. And I like to remind people what we did not know in 1970. We have this very simple idea of the Internet, which is the way it works is you take whatever information you want to transmit and you break it up into these little chunks, which are called packets. And then you put an address on the front of the packet and you hand it into the net, and the net has these little boxes called routers, and each router looks at the address and says, oh, I'll send it here, I'll send it here. And there were several people who had a mathematical proof that that would not work. <laughs> it was what would, what would go wrong is, in fact, the statistics of traffic aggregation would be unstable. And like, say, Oxford at rush hour, it would just all stop. Okay. And the answer was, no, that didn't happen. Although, in truth, it did. But we don't tell people, and we had to fix it afterwards. And along these lines, I, I really would say that it does work amazingly well, given how little the creators knew in 1975. But it has some problems. The problem is not its ability to haul packets around. It does that just great. And what that means is you can build all of these cool applications that run on top of it. The problems are sort of in some other space. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, now, I want to make a very simple distinction. Today, most people who say internet equate it to the World Wide Web. 
And they will, in fact, without thinking, say, well, I went on the web, I went on the internet, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes now they equate it to Google. Um, ten, I, mean, I have a reference point because I gave a talk in 1992. I have the slides in which the web was completely equated with email. I'm sorry, the internet was completely equated with email. We didn't have the web back then. And I don't know what it will be in 10 years. For brand reasons, it may be called the web. I don't know. But the point is, that is not the internet. These are things we would call applications. And they run on top of the internet. So you look at the bottom, and you say, well, we have all this technology down at the bottom. We have ethernets. And if you do wireless, we have this thing called Wi-Fi or 802.11. And, and you can buy circuits from the phone company. And if you're really strange, you have satellites. And that's not the internet either. The internet is on top of that. So, so that raises a very interesting question. If the internet is on top of the technology and it's underneath the applications, then what is it? Of course, one answer is it's a religion. It's an act of faith. Um, in 1994, we drew a little picture. And I know that you can't read the picture, but don't mind. It's a, it's a concept picture. This is, this is what's been called the famous hourglass picture of the internet. And what we were getting at here is that the width of this thing tries to capture the idea of diversity. So down here at the bottom, you have all this technology that I was just talking about. You know, Ethernet, and wireless, and point-to-point -point circuits, and dial-up, and satellites, and everything. And then at the top, you have this soup of application. You have the World Wide Web, and voice over IP, sometimes called internet telephony, and uh, the web, and multiplayer games, and all this cool stuff. And the trick is, how do you take that tremendous diversity at the top and hook it to this tremendous diversity at the bottom? I can tell you the thing you do not want to do, which is to go to the inventor of the World Wide Web or the inventor of a game and say, hey, I have a little thing you have to do. Let me tell you about Ethernet and wireless and satellites. They don't want to know all that stuff. Okay? They want to be separated. They want to be insulated. So the Internet, this conceptual thing called the Internet, which in this picture is drawn at the narrow point, where narrowness is trying to imply lack of diversity, is what I would call a very simple service interface. Now, computer scientists love to do this. It's one of the terms of art, one of our things, is to take a very complicated thing, wrap a very simple wrapper around it, we call this abstraction, and say, don't worry about the mess inside, which sometimes is about as compelling as do not think about the man behind the curtain. But wrap this veneer around it. The veneer is simple. The insides are messy. And so you could say that this, this internet layer, which we would call a protocol, uh, I'll come back to protocol, is the, uh, is the abstraction that separates these two pieces. Uh, I stopped on protocol because I suddenly realized that I was in a place of, of great learning. And so we can go into the etymology of protocol. I wouldn't do this in the United States. if you. If you think about uh, the traditional use of protocol, it comes from diplomacy. And people think of diplomacy as this slightly formalized structure in which countries that don't like each other very much act things out. In fact, in a formal sense, a protocol is an unratified treaty. But my wife, who studied Latin and Greek, said to me, protocol, you know what that means, of course. And I said, well, no. And she said, well, it comes from the Greek word meaning glued on the front proto-colon. It means glued on the front. And I can say, OK, I can understand that you could form such a compound, but why did the Greeks need a word? I mean, you can say, you know, just because you can form it doesn't mean the Greeks needed it. And she said, well, you know, imagine this scroll where you're writing out your, 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 your masterpiece. You'd, you'd like it to have a table of contents at the front, but it's not like you can run it off six times using Word in PDF to see how big it is. You're writing it out. And, you know, it depends on the size of your handwriting how much fits on the scroll. So the question is, well, how much space should you leave at the beginning of the scroll? And the answer is, well, you don't know, because you don't know how much you're going to fit on the scroll, because you don't know how big your handwriting is, and you really haven't checked to see how long the scroll is. So after you're done, you put the table of contents on a separate thing, which you glue on the front. It's the protocolon. And I said, fantastic, because what we do is we break the data into these little chunks, and then we put the address on the front, and that's the protocol. So I went to my friends who used the word. I said, by the way, did you know this being glued on the front? <laughs> and they said, Oh, yeah, didn't you think we had a classical training? I said, OK, I lost that one. <laughs> so, so there is this protocol in the middle, the internet protocol, that defines this cut point. And I'm going to tell you what it does. And it only takes one slide, because it's ridiculously simple. And then I will have done the first part of my talk. OK. I told you we break the data into these little 
packets. And the first thing is there's an address on the front. So we have to agree what addresses look like. Okay. It has to be a convention. Okay. That doesn't matter what it is as long as we all agree. And the only thing I bother to say about the addresses is we screwed up, which is we made them too small. Now, what's interesting is we knew at the time we were making them too small, and we did it anyway. It's one of these situations where there was a friend of mine, and he once said about building systems, and I am a systems builder. He said, if you build a fast, ugly system, everybody who uses it will criticize how ugly it is. And if you build a slow, beautiful system, nobody will use it, so they don't know how beautiful it is. And if we built the addresses big enough to work, we could not have built hardware at the time, so the hardware people told us, that could parse them fast enough. So we had to put in addresses too small so we could build routers so that they could look at the addresses. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. We're going to do this. And they said, yes. OK. So we got the addresses wrong. By the way, the phone company is running out of addresses, too, so we don't have a, a corner on being embarrassed. And, and the other thing is, of course, I take this packet, and I shove it down the wire to the first router. And the other thing that defines the internet is what is the service model? What is the commitment that the network makes to me when it accepts that packet? OK, so here's the commitment that the internet makes when it accepts a packet from my computer. And the answer is none. It tries very hard, but it doesn't promise anything. You give it the packet, and it'll probably come out the other side. And it'll probably come out the other side pretty quickly. But it might get lost. It might get replicated. It might show up 10 times. It might go to Mars first. They might show out of order. How can they get out of order? I could tell you, but that's a digression. Um, we call this best effort. My friends in the telephone industry who thought this was ridiculous called it send it and pray, or every packet is its own adventure. <laughs> and they said, why don't you just build a telephone system? And we said, because that cut point, if you try to find it in the telephone system, is not general enough to build the set of applications we wanted to build. Now, um, you could say, why did we make it so weak? Why did we make that definition so weak? And I'm going to come back to that. But that's the internet. I've told you what it is. It's this very simple service definition, which separates all the innovation that goes on down below. When the internet was built, we didn't have ethernet. We didn't have Wi-Fi. The fastest modem you could buy when we built the internet was 50 kilobits a second. And that wasn't hooking up the home. That was the fastest one you could buy to hook the routers together across the United States. Okay, I like to remind people, the, the dial-up modem that you could get in 1975 went 300 bits per second. Okay. And we built really cool stuff out of that. Okay. So there's been tremendous innovation in the technology underneath the internet. And the internet just sits there and says, oh, it got 10 times faster. All the applications run 10 times faster. That's cool. So the application designers, they just sit on top of this interface. And they say, I'm happy. And in fact, we have a, what I might call a fix-up layer, a layer of software you can run on your computer if you want, which takes care of all these things, like some of the packets got lost, and some of them are out of order, and some of them showed up twice. It's a very simple fix-up layer. Basically, what it does is numbers the packets at the sending end, puts them in order at the receiving end. And if some are missing, it says send them again, and eventually puts them in the right order, and then it gives them back to you. It's called transmission control protocol. It's so easy, almost everybody uses it. But you don't have to. It's just a fix-up layer. Okay. And there's been tremendous innovation above. You know, somebody invented the World Wide Web. Somebody invented multiplayer games. Somebody invented instant messaging. And we just sit there and say, it looks like packets to me. Okay. And this is tremendously empowering, because it means to invent a new application, you don't have to come ask my permission or the router vendor's permission. Imagine trying to modify the telephone system. Well, you go to, the, you know, you go to whoever sells switches to BT. I guess I, let's not go into Marconi. But um, you know, whoever makes these things, and you say, oh, pretty please, could you change the code in all your boxes? And the answer, well, that'd be $5 million in five years. You know, if you want to run a new application on the internet, I'm lying. But if you want to run a new application on the internet, I write the code on my computer. You write the code on your computer. We start sending packets, and we're done. And that's how something like, now I'm not lying, that's how something like Napster or some of these music sharing programs can get millions of users in a month. Because there's nothing stopping you. <laughs> okay. And it's really interesting how fast something can happen when nothing stops you. Now, I said, why did we build this incredibly sloppy service model? Well, the answer was we wanted to run the internet on top of any kind of technology. And of course, in 1975, there wasn't any underlying communications technology that had been built for us. 
we, we gleefully called ourselves a hostile overlay on the internet, uh, on the telephone system. Because the telephone system sold us circuits, but they didn't like us very much. They regularly said, this doesn't work. You ought to stop doing it. You're idiots, various other things. And it was sort of a mantra that we went around for about 15 years until eventually they woke up and said, ugh. But by weakening this definition, you increase the number of technologies over which you can run. And basically, since I said the system makes no commitment whatsoever, <laughs> you can run on top of almost anything. Okay. This makes the application, designers, the application designer's job harder because you have to deal with all this variation in the underlying technology. If the underlying te technology was completely predictable, then you'd have far fewer choices, but the application would be easier. On the other hand, it didn't make it impossible, and especially as a way to get started. And you might say, are we still in the same place now? And the answer is that's one of the issues. But as a way of getting started, this tolerance for diversity was very powerful. So I would argue, yes, this was a good idea, but it is now under attack. And that is part of the reason why this conversation is so interesting. So let me tell you some things that are wrong. And they're pretty obvious. Once I start listing these things, you're going to say, well, yeah. And the most obvious thing is the security of the internet is terrible. Now, I'm going to be, I'm, I just did a flip on you, OK? Because in fact, the security of the IP layer, that very thin veneer that I just talked about, that's actually not so bad. The security problem is in this whole gestalt that the consumer would call the internet. You know, we suffer from spam. Well, that's actually an email problem. That's not an internet problem. If I wanted to draw a line here and be sort of snooty, I could say, well, I'm on the internet side of the line. It's those email guys are the idiots. Okay. Of course, we did that too, but that's different. Um, <laughs> we have spam. We have viruses. We have zombies. Zombies. I'll tell you about zombies later. You know about how many people have come across the zombie phenomenon? I'm getting some hands. I'll tell you. I'll make you really. I'm going to make you. Be, I'm, you're going to be afraid. Okay. And you know, we knew we had a security problem in 19. Well, 20 years ago. Okay. We the first the first virus. I think was 1988. And it was really interesting because all of my friends said, we are being wonderfully hacked. You know, they all had smiles on their face because they thought it was so great. But I, I heard about it. You know, it happened on one day. And the next morning, they were talking it on the morning television show. And I said, we're doomed. You get national press attention in, 1990, in 1988 for attacking the internet. I predicted 1990 would be the decade of the cyber terrorist. And we were just off by 10 years. It's all right. Part of the problem we have with the internet, and I'll come back to this later, is that we had the wrong definition of security. That's to say, we set out to solve the wrong problem. If you set out to solve the wrong problem, you usually don't end up where you want to be. I point out here that you have to deal with the end nodes. If the virus is an end node problem, if it's the PC problem, you can't just draw a line and say, Microsoft is idiots, we're good, just, just go, it doesn't, no, you can't do that. Okay, you have to solve the whole problem. You know, just imagine in going to the government and saying, we're going to solve the internet security problem. And uh, we're not going to solve viruses. We're not going to solve spam. We're not going to solve zombies. We're not going to solve, uh, you know, spyware. Because those are all end node problems. You're going to be laughed out of the room. Don't do it. Okay. So I'm going to talk more about security. It's a compelling problem. We have to get it right. I think we may be at an inflection point in which people's confidence about the internet is actually starting to go down. There are companies that have stopped sending email because all of their customers mistake it for this false email called phishing, and they delete it. And they say, well, that was a legitimate message. How could I tell? I can't tell. You know, the consumer is not a magician. The second thing that is wrong is the industry structure. Now, what am I talking about there? Well, we have these companies. They're called internet service providers. And they sell a product. OK, they sell this packet carriage business. Now, why do they, why do they have the industry structure that they do? Where do they come from? It's worth remembering the, the commercial ISP has only really been about, around as a business entity for about 10 years. And already we see industry consolidation. We see concerns about lack of competition and market power. We see threats by the internet service providers that they would like to begin to erode the core values of the internet, which is to say their tolerance for carrying packets from anywhere to anywhere. They're beginning to say, well, you know, actually, I don't want to carry packets to there unless this guy pays me money. We're going to put up toll booths. The whole structure is, of course, something that was created as a side effect 
of our protocol design. And I didn't really understand this in 1975. Now, any economist would explain this to me. He'd say, if you want to understand where the modularity in the industry structure is going to be, it's where, and I'm going to, I have a, an economist in the audience, so I'm going to watch it and see if I've got it right here, but uh, it's going to be at a place where the, where the, to the overhead of the interface, where the transaction cost is, 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 is low enough that you can afford to compete at that interface. So the place you put your cut points in the technical design help to induce the industry structure. Okay? So it's because we designed IP, as I just described it, as this very simple packet carriage service, that we have internet service providers who are now trying to make money in that package carriage business. And you could look at the shape of that industry, and it's got three interesting characteristics. And one of them is, it's what an economist would call a sunk cost industry, which is say you have to go dig ditches and put fibers in the ground or put up poles. And that money, that's gone, right? You invested it. And now you hope you're going to make business. The second is, it looks like it just might become a commodity business. That's a packet carriage. It's sort of like packet carriage. You know, it's sort of like hauling, hauling you know, bricks around or something like that. There's just really not much product differentiation there. And the third is, because of the tone of the decade, this is not viewed as a regulated industry. This is viewed as a competitive industry. Well, if you, if you say those three features, highly competitive, sunk cost, and commodity, turns out that's not healthy because what it tempts you to do is to undersell your, your, your competitor. And you undersell your competitor until you drive the cost down to the marginal cost of hauling the next packet, which is essentially zero, and then everybody goes out of business. Now, that's, of course, a cartoon-like simplification. What happens, of course, is that the weak companies go out of business, the strong companies absorb them, you discover that it isn't competitive after all, and you realize that it's time for the regula regulators to come back in and regulate. So, so maybe we didn't quite understand all this, and we should try to get it right. Now, you notice these are not technical issues. This has nothing to do with, well, security could be viewed as a technical issue, although in a few slides I'll tell you it isn't. But, you know, if you said to a computer scientist, well, what do you do when you come to work in the morning? And the answer is, well, I optimize something. We are a performance discipline by default, which is our traditional action is to make something faster. And then you draw a little graph, and it looks like that. And this cart goes up, and then you get it published. And then you do three of those, and you get tenure. And, you know, there's, it's the computer scientists in the audience who are laughing. And, you know, there's nothing here about optimizing anything this is, in fact, functioning in this strange, larger context. Okay. I will say something about technology, but I'm not going to say anything about networking technology. What I'm going to say is, imagine a network of 10 years from now. That's what the slide, that's what my title said. What's it going to be like in 10 years? Well, the purpose of the internet is to hook computers together. So the question you should ask is, what will computing look like in 10 years? Don't ask, don't start by saying, I'm a networking geek. So I'm going to tell you about cool new networking. Yeah, OK. We're a plumber, and we should be proud of it. We are building infrastructure for somebody else. Love it. OK. So if you want to know what roads look like in 10 years, tell me what cars and trucks look like in 10 years. Don't just tell me about better roads. So what's computing going to look like in 10 years? Well, the internet actually had a very interesting life. I was about to wave a PC here, but I don't want to drop something. But you know, this one's not hooked to anything. So if I drop it, it won't disable my talk. Um, PC was more or less invented. You can argue about some of the hobbyist computers and the emergence of the IBM PC, but it basically happened around 1980. And because of a total accident, that's basically when the core protocols of the internet stabilized. So they stabilized, and the internet began to grow up as a functioning thing just about the time the PC got real. Um, one of the little claims to fame that I don't bother to put on my resume, but it's, but it's fun. I'm actually sort of proud of it. Is I, I wrote the very first implementation of the, of the Internet Protocol Suite for the IBM PC. IBM had no interest in doing this whatsoever because they wanted the PC to run their proprietary protocols, which were called System Network Architecture, SNA, which were closed and tried to create a, uh, an IBM-centered market. And we said, no, we want these open protocols that any machine can run. So I did the implementation of TCP for that machine. And a lot of my students have never seen a computing environment other than the PC. Now, see, I'm old enough to remember before the PC, we had something called time sharing. And I'm old enough to remember that before the time sharing, we had personal computers, except that you signed up for them by the hour. They were in a large room with operators and glass windows, and they cost 10 or $20 million. It helps to get old. It's not that you can become smarter. You just can remember more and until you start forgetting it. So, so 
Unfortunately, or fortunately, no, sorry, remove the value judgment. What's going to happen in the next 10 years is a radical shift in what computing looks like. It has nothing to do with what networking looks like. It has to do with what computing looks like. For 10 years, we've been using the PC. Um, I, I describe this stage as being stuck on one. And I'll explain what I mean by that. In the old days of time sharing, well, computers were really expensive, and so you had to share. Lots of people had to share the computer. So the ratio was many people, one computer. And sometimes you had many displays in one computer. But as the computer got cheaper, you could begin to have fewer users per computer until that wonderful day when you could have one to one. And all of a sudden, it was yours, and you could put your arm around it. And all of a sudden, you, you, weren't, you weren't a slave to the IT department. Sorry, guys. And you, you weren't a, uh, a slave to the other users. There was this wonderful saying about the personal computer. It was actually a regrettable event. But nonetheless, the saying is, the nice thing about a personal computer is it doesn't go faster at night. So there's these books about innovation in the computer industry. And so why wizards stay up late? Well, why did we stay up late? We stayed up late to stay up later than somebody else, because when he went home, I got more computing cycles, if you could just outlast him. Okay. We don't have to do that anymore. My students come to work at 9 and go home at 5. It's, duh. You know, they didn't want to be that way. Okay. It was a great way to live in the future, because if the machine had been designed to support 30 people and you could outlast the other 29, when you finally got to it, it went 30 times faster, and then you could imagine what living in the future would be like. But it's a trick that we can't do with the personal computer because they don't go faster at night. We don't know how to live in the future now the way we did then. Okay. But computers continue to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. But we've stuck at this ratio of one to one because it's actually so easy to understand. You know, one person, one display, one computer. But you look around you and you see it's getting unstuck. I mean, one, two, three. Um, God knows what else I had here for a look. By the way, in 1980, we would have run a 30-person time-sharing computer system on a machine with this power, right? And it would have been the size of a small room. Okay. This is a phenomenon called Moore's Law, which is not a law at all. It's, it's, a un, it's an unstated uh, business agreement about how fast you should invest in making chips better to get a maximum return on investment. Okay. I'm sorry, that wasn't funny. <laughs> okay, it's true. Okay, but the chips get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So we're going to embed computers in everything. I'm sure you know this has a computer in it, and I don't know whether this has a computer in it, but in 10 years it will. Okay, and this I'm sure has a computer in it. Look at all this stuff. Okay, in 10 years the average computer will cost a dollar. I made that number up, but it's not 10. It might be 10 cents. And if the computer costs a dollar, then the network has to cost 10 cents. Now, why are these computers being embedded in everything? There's, there's a phenomenon which, which I call the silicon imperative. Okay. If you plot the growth of the GDP, you get a curve that, so I should have drawn this on a slide, but you can, if you plot the GDP, you can get a graph that sort of looks like that. You plot the growth of the silicon industry, it sort of looks like that. Okay, it's got a faster slope. Do it on a semi-log graph. Well, obviously, they're not going to run into each other because it's not reasonable for the silicon industry to try to consume the entire GDP. Okay. But how are they growing faster? And the answer is the reason they're growing faster is not because just PCs are getting cheaper. It's because every time they make the chip cheaper, it's cost effective to embed it in a few more things. And so you know, they start getting a fraction of the building material industry. They're getting a huge fraction of the cost of manufacturing a car now. And when they've saturated this market, and when there's a computer in every brick, and a computer in every shoe, and a control in every light bulb, then they can only grow as fast as the GDP. Okay. So there's this imperative. As long as they keep that curve going, then, then, their, then their market segment looks good. So they, they're pushing the stuff out. Okay. But of course, it all works better when it's hooked up. Okay. It's very helpful if there's a computer inside a brick that, assuming it had anything to say and about the only thing, well, it does have something to say, which is, I'm about to crumble or I'm wet. It's a very simple message. It doesn't take many bits per second to say that, which is why I say this is not a decade of performance. Okay. That brick can take a long time to tell you, I'm really unhappy. I'm about to crumble. I'm wet. What do you call it over here? Rising damp? I don't know what this is. But you know, you'd like your house to tell you that there's something going wrong, but it doesn't have to tell you very fast. And 
So I claim that this computer science fascination with performance is actually going to fail for two reasons. And one of them is um, we have to start looking at the larger social space. And the other is we don't care how fast that brick can talk to you, but you want to make sure that it's always hooked up. So we're concerned about ubiquitous networking, pervasive networking, low power networking. You know, you don't want to have a battery in every brick. OK, sort of an issue there. Um, by the way, the way they do that, they are putting, they're not putting computers in bricks these days, but they're putting little computers in, uh, uh, oh, damn. Well, never mind. I brought one to show you. Not a computer in a brick, but I forgot to take it out of my suitcase. I'll take it out when it comes to the question section. Uh, it's somebody who tried to make a computer as small as a grain of rice and failed. But what he had is interesting. Uh, the way they do it, by the way, they, they are putting computers, they're pouring them into concrete in bridges. And of course, they're not powered, but what they do is they have this big truck with this big sort of antenna on the bottom kind of thing, and they position it over the bridge, and they turn the antenna on, and it generates all this RF energy going down into the bridge, and the, the computers sort of pick it up, and then they come alive. And then they, then they feel the bridge and see whether they're, they're in a space that's crumbling or not, and then they send you a message, and then you shut them down again. So you drive the truck across the bridge, and when you come off the other side, you have a good reading as to what the concrete in the bridge is suffering from some sort of erosion. So, so the point is, we got to hook all that stuff up. And 10 years from now, the internet's going to be very different because when we come unstuck from one, it's going to be a dramatic shift. And that's going to happen in the next decade. And I claim the internet may be entirely different, but all of those machines need to be hooked to some global infrastructure. For brand name reasons, we'll probably call it the internet. And it doesn't matter technically how it works, right? You know, you've got, you've got branding issues here. The other issue that I want to talk about in the next 10 years, although I'm not going to say too much about this, is that my fascination about telling you about that little layer in the middle, there are probably 100 people that really care how that works. You know what you care about. You care about the web and email. Those are the applications that bring you. Even geeks don't enjoy sending packets. They want to run the applications. Okay. So we need to break out of our fascination with abstraction and performance and start thinking about how to design applications. Okay. So these are the important trends. A couple others we could mention. Uh, yeah, sure, somebody will invent some new networking technology, but we already know how to incorporate that, right? You just put it under this cut point. The only question is if we redefine the cut point, maybe something's different. Uh, I like to remind people that most of, the, most of the internet technology does not go into the public internet, it goes into private nets. I, I'm making this number up, I think I have it about right. I think nine out of 10 routers that Cisco sells do not go into the public internet, they go into corporate internets and things like that. You know, the public net, the thing that gives you the experience you know about, is a tiny part of this whole world. I like to offer a challenge, a 10-year challenge. Can we make the internet suitable as an infrastructure in times of crisis? Uh, first problem is, can we design it so that it stays up when the power goes down, the way the telephone system does? Uh, this was not on the radar in 1975. But let me not dwell on that. Let me go back to security for a minute. Um, I'm not going to finish the talk, but that's OK. I want to try a concrete question, which is why is security on the internet so bad? Now you could say, well, we're just idiots. Okay. Just technically, we screwed up. You know, we just didn't do it right. And you whack us with a big stick. And uh, occasionally, of course, we greatly enjoy whacking Microsoft with a big stick and saying, you idiots, you shipped Windows and it's got this buffer overflow bug and this exploit, blah, 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 blah. And it's really fun because, you know, they're so vulnerable. And, but we should get over it. We should stop doing that. We should stop doing it because there's no such thing as a five million line program that is bug free. And Microsoft today is the big fat target. I'm very gleeful because I run my little Macintosh here. If it ever gets to be a big enough target, and, and it's already happening, we'll find the, the security flaws in this too. So you have to assume that this software will always be insecure. Nonetheless, they should stop creating this bug called the buffer overflow, which is just a totally stupid bug. But you know, we don't have to have a conference about that. That's where you should whack them with a big stick and just say, and by the way, if you did have a conference, it would not be a conference about networking. It would not be a conference about security. It would be a conference about another aspect of computer science, which is called software engineering, which is how do you build software that works? OK. Different question. It's not what I came to talk about. Now, when you get beyond what I would call the stupid problems, there are a variety of hypotheses about why security on the net is so bad. One hypothesis has to do with economics. There's a thesis which I think is less true now than was true a few years ago, which is that people don't actually care enough about security to pay. They only care enough to whine. And if you actually ask them to pay for it, they won't pay. 
So that's why there's no more attention to product than there is. But of course, I think it's gotten so bad over the last few years that uh, people are paying more attention. I think at this point there's evidence they will pay. They actively go out and buy software packages like you know, spam filters and virus checking, and they buy firewalls, they buy all this kind of thing. So I think this hypothesis is not so true. Uh, there is deep confusion in this space. The most fundamental piece of confusion, which I will get to, is that we don't know what security is. There's this wonderful quote from Yogi Berra, which is, you've got to be real careful if you don't know where you're going, because you might not get there. And uh, then there's sloth. There's despair, which I left out of the list, which is, you know, we raise the hurdle, and they just get smarter and jump over it, so why do we bother to raise the hurdle? You know, why don't we just sit here and live in this quagmire? Uh, and by the way, I want to point out, one of the reasons why security has gotten so bad over the last few years is that the, that the nature of the attacker has changed. Five years ago, it was the, the, the gleeful, I'm doing a stereotype here, but it was sort of the glory-seeking uh, teenage kid who, who wanted to prove that he could attack your machine. And that was, so we sort of understood that, and now it's organized crime. Okay, nothing funny about it at all anymore. It's organized crime. Okay. And I'll tell you what they're doing, which is really pretty freaky, but that's all right. And then, of course, there's the thesis that security makes computers harder to use. There's an old security joke, which is, what is the difference between a really secure computer and a brick? And the answer is, if you wanted to doorstop, the brick is cheaper. So there's a, another thesis that has to be turned on its head, which is not the best security is the perfect security, which is the doctrine of the intelligence community. And it makes sense in the intelligence community, because once the spy stole the stuff, you don't have a lot of recourse. So it's pretty clear that better is an important thing, and best would be good. And they strive for perfection. And if it makes the system unusable, well, these are highly paid professionals, and they should just put up with it. But in a domestic situation, in a consumer situation, the best security is the security that you can actually master so that you'll turn it on and use it. And if it's too complicated, you'll turn it off, and then it's of no use whatsoever. Okay. So there's a whole new sub-discipline arising called human-computer interaction and security, or in the jargon, HCI sec. Okay. But let's look at spam from it. Why, why do we have spam? You know, why, why, why did spam happen? Okay. Well, actually, spam happened because we made a social decision. And the social decision was that we should allow people to send email without identifying themselves per first. Now, we could have made a different social decision. You've got to go to the post office, and you've got to get yourself a certificate, and you've got to type the certificate into your computer, and every time you send a piece of mail, you've got to prove who you are. You know, there are lots of ways I could have clamped that system down and driven this kind of misbehavior out, but I'm not sure we would have liked the social vehicle that resulted. So what you have to invent is not a simple solution, which is to say, put the clamps on. You have to invent a more complicated solution that's respectful of what we think are positive social values of the openness of email without eroding. Uh, you don't want to erode this while you clamp down the negative values. And that's a more complicated design problem. And in many cases, the question is not a technical one. Can I build this? But would somebody please tell me what this is? And that's a social question. What are the values we should embed in a system like email? OK. So let me to tell you why security people are solving the wrong problem. Uh, and this is, in fact, an artifact of history. In the 1970s, all security research was funded by the military and the intelligence agencies. And they had a very simple definition of what security was, which is prevent unauthorized disclosure. That is to say, protect the confidential, protect the classified information. So their focus was on disclosure control and it was an unambiguous challenge. It was more is better. Everybody agreed which way we're marching. We're marching north. North is the right way to go, and the further you get is better. OK. And that was OK until they ran into a buzzsaw. And the buzzsaw was the larger social context. You know, People were saying, oh, we've got to deploy encryption. We've got to get encryption everywhere on the internet. And then they woke up and realized that they were their own worst enemy. I'm talking about, about the National Security Agency. Because in fact, what they desperately wanted was to eavesdrop on everybody. And if everything got encrypted, then they couldn't eavesdrop. So all of a sudden, they said, oh my god, a secure net is one where you cannot have encryption. <laughs> and that brought all the social scientists out who are, are the, adv the, the personal advocates, the advocates for privacy. And they stood up and they said, flame, 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 flame. You can't do this. Now, in fact, I would point out in this space that the privacy folks got no traction whatsoever. But think about the poor security guy who started out life as a mathematician encryptor. 
and all of a sudden discovers that he's in the middle of a social debate about the rights of the citizen to privacy. He's not trained to have that debate. And this simple idea that we're going to explain security as well, better disclosure control, better protection of the integrity of the data, better availability, doesn't reveal the fact that you're in the middle of a tussle, a tangle of adverse values. So I argued that what we had to do was to rethink the framing of security in order to get people to focus on the right problem. So I'm going to give you a framing here, and then I'm going to more or less be out of time. But I'm going to give you a framing here, and I put this up with some trepidation because ideally some social scientist would give me this framing, political scientist, sociologist, something like that. So I actually carry this picture around and I show it to people, waiting for somebody to say, oh, here's the book you ought to have read, you idiot, or whatever. Okay, But, but here's a refactoring. Um, uh, no, not on that slide. I already said this. Uh, you can read it, so I got ahead of myself. But I, I, you know, mathematicians are not the only ones who are dis dis disconcerted when they're doing social engineering. And I would just say, for most of us computer science, we thought that our training was to optimize something. This is a very strange space to be. And uh, the internet embodies a very rich social contract, and we're, we're designing the technology for it. Okay, so, so, so let me introduce this idea of tussle. I picked this word to try to get people to focus on a phenomenon. Um, there are different words for this. But this is an analog looking at social systems. Social systems don't have a final outcome, right? We are constantly evolving what we do in society. You know, you want to put up buildings. Other people don't want you to put up buildings. Somebody wants to build a road. You don't want to build a road. You put up a road. They argue about where the exit ramps go. I mean, this is ongoing process. Society is a process. It's not an outcome. That's very disconcerting to engineers. Engineers understand that we fight over the design spec. But usually once we finish fighting over the design spec, you know, you get your planning permit. You sort of like, then you build the building, right? <laughs> and this idea that after it's built and people are using it, we would continue to, to change it is very disconcerting to engineers because they like to design to a spec, okay? Or they like to build to a spec. You know, and they say, hey, mate, you know, you change the spec after I've started pouring concrete, it's going to cost a lot more. But we keep changing the internet, okay? And that's because people with adverse interests come in and fight over it, okay? And they say, oh, you've got to block the music sharing. So, oh, no, no, no. But this is the world in which the internet lives. So we have to learn how to design for tussle. And that, I think, is a message back to the computer science community. So, so here's, here's some tussle design principles. OK. And the first one is sort of obvious once you think about this. If you're not designing the outcome, you're designing the playing field. But if you recognize you're designing the playing field and you're subtle, then you can tilt it, which is to say, you don't have to be value neutral in this process. Don't, just don't assume you're in charge. Okay. Uh, you are one actor among many. There are other actors, and they have different tools. You have the power to write code. They have the power to pass laws. Okay, They're fighting, and so should you. And of course, this old quote from the baseball game, you can't tell the players without a scorecard. There's this deceptively simple idea called stakeholder analysis, which contains two steps. Identify the stakeholders and write down what they think. And you know, again, when you're doing a building, you sort of understand, oh, there are butters, and there are people who care about wildlife and all these kind of things. You need a sort of a method for deriving them. Okay, I'm going to show you a method for deriving stakeholders in this space in a minute. Uh, analyze the tussles as best you can. You may not be perfect at it, but at least try. You'll be better off than if you didn't think. Uh, and once you found a tussle, isolate it. I'll give you an example of that if I don't run out of time, which I know I'm going to do. And I observed a minute ago that interfaces are a place where industries can connect because it's a low overhead place to connect. That's also a place where tussle often occurs. So in fact, design interfaces, and this is a comment, I'm sure this is too abstract for you to internalize in the way a computer scientist would want to. Most of my computer scientist friends don't understand what I'm talking about until I give them some examples. But you can design interfaces to control the nature of tussle. And in fact, the most powerful way to do it is to leave the interface out altogether. And the telephone industry, which has been persistently regulated, has a long history of very carefully identifying interfaces to leave out so that the regulator cannot then later come along and tell them to open them. Okay. They say, no, it's technically impossible to blah, blah, blah. Look at this whole thing. It's just a big blob of glue. And they say, yeah, they, you bet you know why it was a big blob of glue. Okay. And of course, understand the special role of technology, which I will talk about in a minute. Now, I had a couple examples of design for tussle here. In fact, my first one is an anti-example. I would say it's, it's design for war, which is the, the illegal music sharing folks. Okay. The point I would make about them is they understand 
that the design of their system is not to solve any technical problems, it is to solve social problems, which in this case is to avoid being sued, right? So you run and hide, your programs flit about, they use identifiers that are random and constantly changing, uh, and these guys are at war, okay? They think they're Robin Hood, okay? They're stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, which in this case is them, but the music industry makes a wonderful sheriff of Nottingham. Okay. In our country, it was epitomized by a guy named Jack Valenti, who played the role just perfectly, and they alienated a whole generation of, of music consumers. When you, look at your, when you look at your customer base and say, I deem you thief, okay, it's a really bad social relationship. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, uh, so, maybe, so maybe music sharing is supposed to be tussled, not tolerant. It's, it's actually gone to war, put on its armor plating every morning when it gets up. But they certainly understood they were in a social space. Okay. Uh, naming and instant message systems, I'll just give you this one example, I won't bother to elaborate the others. If you've ever used an instant message system, you communicate with somebody by identifying their buddy name, okay? And you send a message to the buddy, you know, you type on the thing. When you send the message normally, and I stress normally, because this is, I'm telling you a cartoon story. The message doesn't go from you to them, it goes to a server, and then the server sends it on to them. So, well, why'd you do that? And there are about five reasons, but one of them was, very interesting, I want you to be able to talk to each other without revealing that low-level IP address that I talked about to each other. So well, why wouldn't you want to reveal the IP address? And the answer is because if you find it, then you'll attack the guy because, you know, you're both 12 years old and you're bored and you don't like him because he just said something stupid. And so I'm going to give you privacy or I'm going to, basically it's a system for communication with imperfect trust, which is I want to talk to you, but I don't really trust you. And so you intermediate it. Okay. That's a tussle. Okay. It's facilitating communication without trust. Okay. People are doing this. They just don't catalog it. So here's my new framing of security. It focuses on four classes of things I call concerns. Personal concerns, shared concerns, communal and global concerns. Personal concerns are these things that you might have just as a part of being embedded in this space. Uh, privacy is an obvious one. Sometimes people equate all of this to privacy, but you could distinguish freedom from attack, freedom harassment, stability of your space. You know, you don't want the data on your computer to go away. Now, these concerns arise, even though you didn't send any messages to anybody, but uh, the Internet is, of course, a shared experience. When you communicate with somebody, this is a shared environment. Yeah, I know. I'm looking at my watch. All right, let's talk, cut this short. But uh, in order to talk to somebody, you have to arrange some agreements with them. You know, you might say, as I said a minute ago, I want to talk to you, but I don't want to show you my IP address because I don't trust you, so I want, somebody, I want a third party in the middle to to strip the address up. Or you could say, I want to encrypt the conversation. And they say, no, I won't encrypt it. I, won't, I don't do encryption. I insist we do this so that witnesses can watch it. When you don't trust somebody, witnesses are a really good idea. Why would you have an encrypted conversation, a private conversation, with somebody you don't trust? There's this old saying somebody made up, which is having an encrypted conversation with somebody you don't trust is like meeting a stranger in a dark alley. If you get mugged, there are no witnesses. And you know, why do you get mugged on the internet? Well, they give you a virus. Okay, so why would you do that? Okay. So, in fact, there's a very strong space of shared concern. Then there are communal concerns. These are the concerns which we, as a society, might elevate to the point where we embed them in law, uh, civil public space, regulated commerce, balance of the, the government, the duties of the citizen and the police. And then finally, of course, the Internet is global. It transcends jurisdictions. It transcends societies. And at the level of packet carriage, it just does the same thing everywhere. So I drew this picture which tried to capture this. The point I wanted to make here, if you look at that red box, which I labeled communal concerns, what you find is the concerns of the state tend to constrain that blue box, which I called shared concerns. You cannot disclose certain private information, even if you and I agree, if you have a privacy law that says you can't do it. Okay. The shared concerns, big, big, the big players may trump the interests of the little players. There's this cynical statement that privacy is what's, ever, what's left over after everybody else has had their share. Personal concerns may be left over. You can't advocate for yourself very well, so you have these aggregators of personal concerns, uh, consumer advocates, civil liberties advocates, who basically try to aggregate that concern and elevate it to the level where it becomes a communal concern. And that's a tussle space, and you go round and round it. Okay. And then, of course, off to the side, there's global concerns where the two important factors, one is local values. Um, the diversity of local values is a tension with the fact that, in some sense, the Internet starts out by working the same everywhere. Okay. 
And then, of course, limits to jurisdiction. You can't arrest the spammer because he's in this country with which we have no extradition treaty. I won't name a country. I don't want to insult somebody. But there are cartoon com countries that stand as the proxy for the bad place where stuff comes from. Um, so how could you, do, how could you capture, capture the essence of spam? We could say, look, it's a global problem. We have to solve it. So one of the ideas in that space is we'll make everybody in the world send a penny before they can send a piece of spam. And then the spammers send a million copies. They'd have to send a million pennies. And that's fine until you ask. Uh, the email came from one of these countries where we don't trust the government, we don't trust the banks, and we don't trust the ISPs. Why do you think you actually paid the penny? Are we about to commit a million dollar fraud one penny at a time? Ooh, it's really hard to make a global system work. So you could say, well, let's solve it at least within our own. You know, in the United States, we have this law called the Can Spam Act, which has been passed in, parsed in two different ways. Um, most of the spammers thought it meant you can spam. But in fact, what it said was really subtle. It said you cannot lie about your identity when you send spam. And since most of the unsolicited spam involved a lie about who you were, you weren't arrested for sending unsolicited email. You were, you, you, you were arrested for fraudulently modifying your from address, and spammers are now going to jail. OK. Or you could say, look, let's just form a mail club. It's three and close. My, my closest three friends, well, that's fine. When I get mail from somebody else, I'll scrub it very carefully and read it once a month. But, but among ourselves, we can be happy. And then there's, well, I'll solve spam personally. I'll just buy a spam filter, and the rest of the world can do what it does. OK. Well, those are four different framings of a problem. So I'm going to skip over a bunch of slides here, because I didn't know how long I would take. I wanted to, to slow down there and sort of get the beginning right. Let me just talk about the role of tussle for a minute. And, and this, of course, is a social science comment. This is not a technical comment. Technologists have no special right to define cybersecurity. We have a right, but no special right. We are all actors on this bus. If you, uh, if you look at the special role of technology, for those of you who, who, who find uh, Bruno Latour interesting, and I don't know here whether that's a good thing or a bad thing to say. I've, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the different spaces in which you can mention Bruno Latour. But he wrote a paper titled, Technology is Society Made Durable. And by embedding artifacts in code, we, in fact, make them hard to change. And we understand that. The internet is somewhat resistant to change, despite the fact I talk about how plastic it is and how fast we can change things, because we have embedded values in our code. And, and I think that in this space, it's worth asking, what are the values of the internet? We wrote the code. We should at least be honest and tell you what our values are, because we embedded them in the code. And here are some of them. One is user empowerment. We believe in the power of the user to do as they please. You could say that's ideological. You could say it's economic. It's the power of choice. It's the discipline of, of, of competition. Or it's, or it's a deeper value that you know, it's sort of you know, equality or something, or uh, equity. We believed in anonymous action and freedom. Of, uh, and sort of, uh, we didn't believe in a, in a heavy-handed uh, deterrence. So some people have likened this to a sort of a Hobbesian global village where everybody's running around wearing masks. Uh, we wanted to sustain innovation and experimentation. We, we had, and I could tell you why, but that's another talk, we had an instinctive distrust of those in control. We thought anybody who wanted to be in charge was probably self-serving, and so we killed them prophylactically. Uh, we clearly believed in that which is not forbidden is permitted. And who suffered from this naive users? User empowerment was the power to suffer. Oh my god, this has crashed. Oh my god, I need to install an upgrade. My DLLs are screwed up. Say, yeah, Brett, that's, well, that's the world we built for you. Um, the national security guys, now by, I said I'd tell you why they fell over. It's really interesting. The privacy guys went up against them over encryption and said, oh, we got to have this stuff. And they said, Pfft. So big business went in and said, we have to do e-commerce on the internet. E-commerce is important to our economy. If you don't let us do encryption, the consumer will be worried that the credit card number will be stolen. And if the credit card number is stolen, then nobody will do e-commerce. And you're stopping the progress of the American blah, blah. This is an American debate, right? This was, this was, we, were, we were the bad guys in this debate. And when that happened, they said, oh, OK. OK, so you can tell who wins and who loses compared to national security. OK, OK. So where in this picture are the values of the internet? It's very clear. We had social values, and we knew exactly where they were embedded. OK, they're embedded down here. Some sensitivity to shared concerns, a lot of sensitivity to personal concerns, relatively few sensitivities to communal concerns, and perhaps an inadequate awareness of this. OK, that's where the internet started from. And what we're going to fight over in the next 10 years is where the center of gravity of that picture shifts. OK, and it is in a space where you're allowed to advocate your values. And we could have very strong. Values, OK. 
And we have the power to write code. I like to remind my friends, there are other people who have the power to write laws, that have the power to lobby, that have the power to invest a billion dollars. You know, don't forget what they do. Be proud of your power. Go and use it. Okay. But we have to think about values. And part of what's interesting to me here is what disciplines can help us do this. And in what disciplines is study of values a valid subject of research? And I think, perhaps, I'm going to skip all these security slides. Never got to tell you about zombies. Going to skip all the economics. So I talked about tussle design principles. I said you're designing the, the outcome, just the playing field. I think, in fact, you, you as a computer designer, and you here means me, um, it's, not, it's quite appropriate to, use your, to, to advocate for your values. And you don't have to say publicly what they are, because they don't either. But at least among yourselves, you want to acknowledge, do, do I know why I'm building this the way I'm building it? Do I understand why I'm persistently creating a problem that makes it worse and worse for the National Security Agency? Do I understand why I'm doing this? Um, I gave you two framings of, of, a, of an important tussle spaces. One is centered around security. It's the balance of accountability and deterrence on one side with privacy, anonymity, and freedom of action on the other side. Something I didn't talk about, which is really important, which is the allocation of liability. You will notice something very interesting that happened. Microsoft ships this code with all sorts of bugs. They have created a world in which they are absolutely free of any liability for those problems. They've done this by going to the government and simply making it so. OK, and you may say, how'd they get away with that? And the answer is, well, come on. OK. What would happen if every time your computer crashed, you got to sue Microsoft? OK. They, they were so worried about that, they just had it ruled out. I mean, you can't do it. OK, they have an exemption. OK. I asked our present government if there was any chance of this issue being on the table as part of improving security. And they said, just don't even bring it up. OK. That's a closed book. OK. Well, I learned something. Okay. And I like to remind you that most of the people we talk to on the internet we don't trust. The simple model of, I want to talk to you, and so I want this private channel because I trust you, and it's the bad guys who are the third guys. No, I'm talking to people, and I don't trust them. Okay, I want help. I want intermediation. I want witnesses. I want filtering. Okay. And the other set of tussle is centered around economics, and I didn't get to that. Sorry about that. But it is centered around interconnection, freedom of choice, open access to the internet platform. You should always ask who makes money. That's a very well-known quote. Don't forget to ask it here. And one example, no, I, I won't even do that. I want to I wrap up so that uh, we, we have time for questions. Um, I, I'm giving this talk in a variety of spaces because what I'm really doing is trying to engage interesting people from other disciplines who ha say, I have models and tools that you should know about. You should read this book. You should learn about this. Here's how we, here's how we structure the social space of, of Tussle. You know, go learn game theory. Go learn whatever it is. You know, go learn about you know, arrows and possibilities there, whatever it is you want to learn, you know, you ought to have this as part of your, your set of tools. And, and I get all sorts of interesting answers. However, I want to point out, these have to be future-looking tools. There are a lot of disciplines focused on analysis, which I cynically describe as, first we build it, then they show us how we got it wrong. And I like to say, no, 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 come sit at the table with us while we design it. And they, I've had some disciplines say to me, my toolkit doesn't let me look into the future. Or as one very gentle academic very precisely said to me, if I did that, I wouldn't get tenure. And now you know what you've come across. Okay. And then what we need to do more specifically, and this is focused on computer scientists, we need to catalog of design techniques and design patterns, which is a phrase we stole from architecture. And we need to study existing solutions. And here, it's actually not so interesting to study the internet. We should study applications, because that's where the problems arise. And a lot of these design patterns should focus on applications. And as I said, I think the next decade, Will be, will be the decade of the application, but uh, that's another talk. So let me stop, and let's see what kind of questions we get. Right? With luck, we'll have some. Uh, do you want to drive, or shall I drive? Your choice. Okay. Thank you.